chapter of the voice of Sarah Man. <clears throat> I know I sent you a link for um, some 10 minute lectures or 15 minute lectures, whatever it was, on two towers, but I decided since we actually do have today for the two towers in Return of the King, we'll go ahead and try and finish it. Um, 581. Saruman has already made his three appeals to Theoden. His first appeal was interrupted, let's say, um, by Gimli. His second appeal by Amir. And the third appeal, Theoden himself replies to and says, we'll have peace with Orthanc when you're hanging from a, a gibbet. Okay. So then Saruman attempts to appeal to Gandalf. And he really pours out all the charm on this one. Okay. And Gandalf replies, what have you to say that you did not say at our last meeting? Now keep in mind, his last meeting was when Saruman imprisoned him in Orthanc. And Saruman goes on and talks about unsay, I don't have anything to unsay. Talks about how our friendship could bring peace to Middle Earth, etc., etc. And he finishes with this. Let us understand one another and dismiss from thought these lesser folk. Let them wait on our decisions. For the common good, I am willing to redress the past and to receive you. Will you not consult with me? Will you not come up? And we're told, so great was the power that Saruman exerted in this last effort that none that stood within hearing were unmoved. Okay, now obviously, who does none include? Even Gandalf. That is, even Gandalf hears this and is like, wow, Sarah, man, that's really good. Okay? But what the others hear and believe is we're goners. Of course he's going to go up. Of course he's going to decide with Sarah, man, what to do. Because they're all thinking that they would go up if he had asked them. Well, not only that, but because of the power of his voice. Keep in mind, Gandalf tells us Sarah, man's power is in speech. And he doesn't mean rhetoric, I don't think. I think he means the sound of his voice. There was a, um, back in the 70s, I think it was, uh, there was a audio version of The Lord of the Rings done. It was a 26-part series, um, half-hour installments, or Yeah, 26 or 13 part series, I can't remember which. Half hour, hour installments. And the actor who did the voice for Sarah Man is a guy named, he's dead now, Ted Cassidy, I think that was his name, who played um, no, I'm sorry, I got a different actor in mind. If you do an IMDB search for Ted Cassidy, you'll see his face but I'm sure you can find, probably find some audio. But if you, if you find audio of that production and, and listen to him, I mean, it's just the smoothest voice. It's like honey dripping from his tongue, okay? So he's, he's really, really good. But Gandalf breaks the spell. There's nobody else that intervenes first. And Gandalf laughs, okay? Why does he laugh? Why not? No, Saruman, your voice has no power over me. Because if he laughs, then it's like an insult to someone, and he does drop the power himself. It's like scorn. Like, come on. This is me. Saruman, Saruman, you should have been the king's jester <laughs> and earned your bread and stripes, too, by mimicking his counselors. Understand one another? I fear I am beyond your comprehension. Kind of like when Gimli tells Aelmer, you know, you speak of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought. Okay, I am beyond your comprehension. He says, but you, I understand too well. Now, think of that word, understand. Turn the two elements around. Stand under. Foundation for. Gandalf is saying, I completely... Um, Know your mind. But me, you can't stand under me. 
I keep a clearer memory of your arguments and deeds than you suppose. So he keeps talking to him. He says, but I have something to offer you. Will you not come down? Sarah man, no, I won't. <laughs> Gandalf, you need not fear for your skin. I do not wish to kill you or hurt you, as you would know, if you really understood me. See, this is Gandalf's proof that he is beyond Sarah man's comprehension. What does Sarah man think Gandalf wants? Pay him back. Okay. Or what else? To bring justice to both lords and lords. He wants a staff. He thinks Gandalf wants power. Does Gandalf want any of those things? No. I mean, he says, I'll let you leave, but you have to leave me the keys and your staff for safekeeping. Later on, in a few pages, Pippin is going to ask, what if Sauron doesn't win? Then what will you do with Saruman? And Gandalf replies, I? Nothing. I will do nothing to him. I do not wish for mastery. Okay. Later on in talking with Denethor, he's going to say, I do not seek mastery. He doesn't want power over other things, which is the exact opposite of what Saruman wants. Okay. So, back to page 582, I do not wish to kill you or hurt you, as you would know if you understood me. I have the power to protect you. I am giving you a last chance, which actually is not the last chance. Because Gandalf's going to offer him another last chance after the ring is destroyed and they're on their way back towards the Shire. All right? So, Sarah Man interprets what Gandalf means and Gandalf explains again when he says, you can leave free. I say free. When I say free, I mean free. Free from bond of chain or command. To go where you will, even to Mordor, Sir Man, if you desire. But you will surrender to me the keys of Warthank and your staff. In other words, he's not saying, here's what I mean by free. You are free to go, but I'm going to put a homing device on you. You're free to go, but you're going to be electronically surveyed or, you know, monitored. You're free to go, but you can't go here. Or free. They shall be pledges of your conduct, conduct to be returned later if you merit them. That is, if your actions show that you are trustworthy, then we'll return to you the keys of Orthanc and your staff. Does Orthanc really belong to Sarah Man? No. If, if it belongs to anybody, who does it belong to? It belongs to Aragorn. Yeah, Aragorn. It was made by the men of Numenor. Okay. So Sarah Man has a few other things to say and walks off. And then Gandalf proves to Sarah Man what he means when he says, I am beyond your comprehension. I did not give you leave to go. Come back, Sarah Man. And Sarah Man, like a hand is pulling, you know, turns around. I have not finished. You have become a fool, Sarah Man, and yet pitiable. Even Sarah Man, Gandalf feels pity for. You might still have turned away from falling evil and have been of service. Notice that. You might have turned from folly and evil. You might have turned from foolishness and been of service. Gandalf is placing an emphasis on serving others. Okay? But you choose to stay and gnaw the ends of, <coughs> excuse me, of your old plots. He chooses to, rather than to serve others, Free peoples of Middle Earth, what does he choose to do? Focus on his own wants, focus on his own desires. Behold, I am not Gandalf the Grey, whom you betrayed. I am Gandalf the White, who has returned from death. This makes it clear that when Gandalf says earlier, I wandered far on roads unknown that I won't talk about, 
and I came back unclothed, he means I was dead, and now I'm undead. You have no color now, and I cast you from the order and from the council. From the order, the order of Istari, or the wizards. Now what this means is Gandalf is saying, you are no longer what you once were. He's changing Saruman's being, in other words. Okay? In terms of his existence in Middle Earth. Is he basically saying you are no longer a semi demigod you are the Mormon? No. He doesn't have the power to say you're no longer a Maya. Okay? He can't do that. But when when the Istari, when they enter Middle Earth, or let me rephrase it, when the when these particular Maya Enter Middle Earth, they enter Middle Earth as wizards. Okay, and when I said these particular ones, I mean Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast the Brown, and there's actually two others that are never named. Okay, there are five Istari. When they enter Middle Earth, they take on a form, okay, that is specific and peculiar to them. And what Gandalf is saying is, you're no longer one of these. That is, you're still a Maya, which we know because what happens when Saruman dies? It's like he turns into a mist and whoop, blows away. And all that's left there is like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi's cloak. It's <laughs> just a cloak. There's no there there, so to speak. Okay? And so he raises his hand. Saruman's staff is broken. Okay. Wormtongue throws out the palantir. Pippin picks it up. And we go on to the next chapter. Skipping of several pages. Because Pippin picked it up, he now has itchy fingers. And so he goes and he replaces the palantir that Gandalf is sleeping with with a rock, looks into it, and eventually he sees Sauron. Okay? So Gandalf makes Pippin tell him what he saw. And Gandalf looks into his eyes and says, it's okay, there's no evil there. But then he says on the top of 594, mark this, you have been saved, and all your friends too, mainly by good fortune as it is called. Now, why does he add the as it is called? Because he doesn't actually believe it's good fortune. Because it's not good fortune. There's something else. There's another power at work here. Okay? You cannot count on it a second time. Now, by including that, I think that's Tolkien's way of telegraphing to his readers. Readers, if you have read my essay on fairy stories, you know what this is a minor example of. It is a you catastrophe. It is a sudden and miraculous turn, never to be counted on to recur. Okay? Catastrophe. In, in our kind of modern mindset or parlance, we think of a catastrophe as what? Necessarily. We think it's always bad. That a catastrophe is always a disaster. It's not what it literally means. What it literally means is a sudden turn or a sudden change. So yeah, you know, a magnitude 9 earthquake in San Francisco or LA would be a sudden turn, a sudden change. There would be millions of people dead. Okay? What we need to distinguish between are a disk catastrophe, like a large magnitude earthquake in a heavy, heavily populated area. You know, think of the New Madrid Fault outside St. Louis just suddenly ripping like it did in the early 19th century. Okay? That would be a disk catastrophe. Uh, 
terrorists smuggling a nuclear bomb into you know New York would obviously be a discatastrophe. Tolkien says there are also you catastrophes, a good sudden turn or change. Okay? Like, for example, one of you turning on the TV tonight and finding out, you know, you're watching the news or whatever, and they're doing the Powerball lottery, and you've got the winning number. Obviously, I think most people would say, yes, you know, sudden good change. Leave school, set up for life, you know. It could have its, it could be its own discatastrophe, as Albus Dumbledore will tell us uh, when we get to book one. Okay. So at the end of that passage, Gandalf then gives to Aragorn the Palantir because he says, obviously, this belongs to you. It was made by the men of Numenor. And what does Palantir mean, by the way? Literally, far seeing. Literally, television. It's a seeing stone. You look at it, and you can see things long ways off. It cannot lie. That is, if you look into the Palantir, somebody on the other end cannot make you see something that is untrue, which is pretty important for when we get to Denethor later on. Okay? So they suddenly find out there's a dark rider up in the air above them. And Gandalf and Pippin leave. Because Gandalf needs to get Pippin as far away from the Palantir as possible. Because he knows he's going to be tempted to look into it again. So they get on to Shadowfax and they make their way to Minas Tirith. And Gandalf tells Pippin about the Palantir, why they were made, what they were used for. Okay. How Sarah Man was able to know certain things and such. And we get to the end of book three. You know, I remember the last time we met, we talked about how Tolkien, you know, takes the narrative, which starts off kind of as a like a tapestry, and he starts to unravel the threads. So now we have Gandalf and Pippin off on their own. We have Sam and Frodo off on their own. We have Mary, Legolas, Gimli, Aragorn off on their own. Did I miss somebody over there? No. And now Tolkien takes us all the way back to where we were at the end of the first volume. Frodo and Sam. We see Frodo and Sam going off into the Immin Mule. And I want to skip a whole bunch here and pick up to after they drop down the cliff, they realize Gollum is still behind them. And we actually hear Gollum on page 613 in the chapter of the Taming of Smeagol. Ah, gosh, it's my precious, more haste, less speed. We mustn't risk our neck, must be precious, no, precious, no. He lifts his head. He says more things as he's looking at the moon. And he drops, and Sam jumps him. Gollum bites him. I mean, after all, Sam attacked him. Okay. And on page 615, they've got a rope. Uh, they don't have the rope on him, but Frodo has Sting out. And he says, you've seen this before, and if you move, I'll kill you. And so they're trying to decide, what do we do with Gollum? Sam says, tie him up and leave him. But that would kill us, kill us, grew a little off and says, tie us up in the gold hard lands, leave us, call him, call him. Frodo says, no, if we're going to kill him, we have to kill him outright. Poor wretch. He has done us no harm. Sam rubs his shoulder because he's got fang marks, you know, where Gollum bit him. He hasn't. Anyway, he meant to, and he means to, I warn. He intends us harm. So in Sam's mind, what does that mean? Kill him. You know, it's like Sam has read Philip K. Dick's, you know, Minority Report, or the book that Minority Report film is based on. Frodo, 
you're you're probably right. I dare say, said Frodo. That is, you're right. He probably does mean to throttle us in our sleep. But what he means to do is another matter. In other words, we cannot pronounce judgment on him because of something he hasn't done but is contemplating. Tolkien would be very much against, apparently, the idea of preemptive war, of launching an attack against an enemy because you think that enemy is going to do something to you. And he stands there thinking, and suddenly he hears, what a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. I do not feel any pity for Gollum. He deserves death. Deserves death? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some that die, some die that deserve life. Can you give that to them? Then be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice, fearing for your own safety. Notice, Tol Gandalf didn't actually say, then be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice. He said, be not too eager to deal out death in judgment. Fearing for your own safety, even the very wise cannot see all ends. And then what does Frodo say in response to all that? Still, I'm afraid. And yet, as you see, as who sees? It's like Frodo is talking to Gandalf, even though Gandalf is not physically present. And Frodo thinks Gandalf's dead. As you see, I will not touch the creature. For now that I see him, I do pity him. Why else does Frodo pity Gollum? And it's, it's related to actually seeing him. What does he see when he sees Gollum? Himself. He knows now the power of the ring. And I don't mean put it on, you disappear, all that kind of stuff. I mean, he knows now the power, the pull of the ring on him. And he has a little sliver of a glimmer of an inkling of an idea of what it must feel for Gollum, who held the ring for 600 years. Okay. So, they talk. And he tames Gollum. And how does he tame him? What does he make Gollum do? He swears an oath. Gollum says, second to the last page of the chapter, we will swear to do what he wants. Yes, yes. Frodo swear. Smeagol, notice not we, not Gollum, Smeagol. Smeagol will swear on the precious. Frodo, on the precious? How dare you? One ring to rule them all, etc. On the precious, on the precious. What will he swear? To be very, very good. Smeagol will swear never, never to let him have it, never. Smeagol will save it. But he must swear on the precious. Frodo, no, not on it. All you want to do is look at it, and looking at it will make it even worse for you. All right? And we're told, for a moment it appeared to Sam that his master had grown and Gollum had shrunk. A tall, stern shadow, a mighty lord who hid his brightness in gray cloud, and at his feet a little whining dog. Yet the two were in some way akin and not alien. They could reach one another's minds. This is the first of two visions like this Frodo will have. The other one is just outside the cracks of doom. He's going to see Frodo as a tall, stern lord, dressed all in white, unmovable by pity. And Gollum like a pitiable, starved thing. So what does Gollum swear? 
We promises? Yes, I promise. I will serve the master of the precious good master. Good to be in Golden Golem. And Frodo says, take the rope off, Sam. What mistake does Frodo make here? He didn't have him swear on something. Because he said he couldn't eat the ring. Okay. He didn't have Gollum uh, declare the master. It should be Frodo that should be the master. Exactly. Frodo's never taken a course in, you know, negotiation 101, so to speak, or contract law. Because he doesn't specify who the master is. So, in Gollum's twisted mind, or, you know, I'm personally, I'm with Gollum on this one. <laughs> if I become the master of the precious, then I, still I swear to myself. Yeah, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Swearing to yourself. So what Frodo should have done is he should say, ah, no, that's not good enough. It needs to be, I will serve the master of the precious, a.k.a. Frodo Baggins of Baggin, Baggin the Hobbiton, Shire, Middle Earth, the world, okay, who is the rightful owner and master of the precious until such time that the precious shall no longer be in existence. You got that golem kid, now repeat after me. That's what he should have done, okay? So Gollum promises and becomes a faithful servant. And he leads them on. They go through the passage of the Martians. Go to page 625. They, they come out of the rocky area of the Emmanuel. And now they're at the, the marshes, and there's marsh to the right, marsh to the left, and just marshland all off in front of them. And we're told that where they are is the plain of Daggerland, which we've already heard back in the Council of Elrond. Okay? This is where, in the previous age, in the last alliance of elves and men, there is a huge battle. And Frodo asks, how do we shape our course now, Smeagol? That's an interesting way of phrasing it. How do we shape our course? He's saying, how do we choose our way? How do we make our path? Later on, not very far from here, Frodo is going to talk as though their path is laid for them. That he doesn't really have a choice. That it's like he steps and the stone is placed underneath his feet as he steps. Okay? Tolkien is saying something here, it seems to me at least, about actions and choices in our lives and how those actions and choices determine what our lives become. And yet at the time that we make those actions, or take those actions, and make those choices, it doesn't seem that way. And yet when you get to the end, so to speak, and you can look back, you can see this wide meandering journey. And see where at each point, a door opens, a door closes. Okay? So, Gollum says, we do need to go through here. And they make their way forward. And Sam stumbles at one point and falls and gets his hands in the muck. And his face gets this close to one of the watery pools. And he says, bottom of 627, there are dead things, dead faces in the water. Dead faces. Gollum, yes, the dead marches, yes, yes. Okay. And then Frodo talks about Seeing them too. Grim faces and evil, noble faces and sad. Many faces proud and fair, and weeds in their silver hair, all foul, all rotting, all dead. And Gollum explains who and what they are and talks about, you know, having tried to reach the faces before because he was hungry. Kind of disgusting. Okay. Now this image, or these images, of faces in the water, for 
a while after the books were first published, everybody just thought, oh, that's just Tolkien being morbid and stuff. It's not. These are images from World War I. Okay? Because there have been multiple World War I vets who have become writers who have included this image in their work. And from all that we can gather is men would make their way across, and soldiers would make their, their way across the muddy fields of French, fighting from one trench to another, crawling on their bellies, they would come across disembodied heads, lying in pools, and, you know, see Fred looking up at you with the rest of Fred not there, so to speak. All right? So this is probably an example of Tolkien's own war history coming out. So they keep making their way, and they get to outside the Black Gate. And they're, they're sitting on a hillside, and they look, and everything around them is disgusting. It's like a volcanic um, area. And Sam wakes up, page 632, and he sees that Frodo... Where they had slept, they'd been on the side of this pit. Frodo has rolled down to the bottom. And Gollum's down there next to him. And Sam listens. And he hears Gollum talking. And look at Gollum's conversation. We're not going to go into it in detail. But we hear two voices. And we see two different sets of eyes, almost. A pale light and a green light alternated in his eyes as he spoke. The first, a pale light, Smeagol promised, Yes, yes, my precious. We promise to save our precious, not to let him have it. But it's going to him, yes, near every step. So when that voice speaks, the, light, the eyes turn green. I don't know, I can't help it. Master's got it. Smeagol promised to help the master and the light. And the eyes turns pale. Yes, yes, to help the master, the master, the precious. But if we was master, and the eyes are green again. Why green? Because that's talking. Okay. Gollum. It's Gollum talking. Gollum talking. Right. Why else? Have you ever heard of the phrase? Monsters. The green-eyed monster, which is what? Jealousy or envy, greed. Notice right there you have three of the seven deadly sins, by the way. Okay. And so they keep talking. But not the nice hobbit. No, not if it doesn't please us. Still, he's a baggins, my precious. Yes, a baggins. We hate bagginses. No, not this baggins. And I, you know, switching back and forth. And Sam's sitting there thinking, this isn't good. <laughs> What's going on in Gollum? An internal struggle for control. Yeah. But what does this internal struggle at least show us? There is good in you, Father. There is still a little element of good in Gollum. Okay? The part that promised... The part that says, oh, but this is the good pagans. He took the nasty rope off us. Okay? And then Gollum says, we want it. She might help. She might help. No, no, not that way. You know, Smeagol doesn't want to have anything to do with she. We have no idea who she is at this point. Okay? So they go and they see the Black Gate and they see hundreds and thousands of orcs and everything. And it's like, well, this isn't any good. And Gollum says, you asked me to take you to the Black Gate. Here you are at the Black Gate. You didn't ask me to take you to the secret entrance into Mordor. Okay. So they go on and on. And finally, Gollum does tell them there is another way. But he won't tell them that it's guarded. But they know that it is. And we get on page 644. 
Frodo's kind of wrestling with what to do. And the narrator tells us what this other place is called or what this other way is called. Kirith Ungol and such. Frodo doesn't know what the other name is. Okay. And he's thinking about all of this. And we're told at the bottom of that, that first half of page 644, And here he was, a little halfling from the Shire, a simple hobbit of the quiet countryside, expected to find a way where the great ones could not go, or dared not go. It was an evil fate, but he had taken it on himself in his own sitting room in the far off spring of another year. Notice, it was an evil fate, but he had taken it upon himself, in which case, it's not fate. He chose to do this. Okay? So remote now that it was like a chapter in the story of the world's youth when the trees of silver and gold were still in bloom. You have to go back to the Silmarillion to read about the trees of silver and gold. This was an evil choice. Okay? What's the this? Follow Gollum and go down to the place that's guarded. What way should he choose? And if both led to terror and death, what good lay in choice? Frodo's decision is, do I go knock on the black day gate of Mordor and say, hello, Frodo from the Shire, um, can I come in? <laughs> or try and find this other way. He says, if both led to terror and death, what good lame choice? If both of them are equally despairing, why choose? Why not just sit on this slag heap and rot? Okay. What does um, Aragorn reply when Aelmer asks him, what doom do you bring from the north, Lord? The doom of choice. The doom of choice. Every decision is an act of judgment. Every decision does what? It opens one way and closes off another. Okay? Even though in our modern world we like to try to say, oh, no, it doesn't. You can have both choices. You can have everything you want and be happy. You don't have to have any consequences for any actions or decisions whatsoever. Okay? So, they follow Gollum. And we go to chapter 4 of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. Why does Sam make Frodo a stew? Gollum hunts, catches him a couple of, couple of rabbits, a brace of conies as he calls it. Okay. Sam cooks it all up. Has, Frodo, has Gollum look for taters? Why? Okay. What's happening to Frodo? He's starting to stare. He's thin. He is shriveled down. He's no longer a fat little hobbit. Okay. And Sam thinks, if he had a good square meal, you know, Limbus bread is good, but if he had a good square meal in him, okay, but because Sam makes stew and causes a fire, which creates smoke, they get captured. And... Page 657, they meet Faramir. And Faramir says, I am Faramir, captain of Gondor. And they keep talking. And Ar uh, Frodo tells Faramir a little bit about what they're doing. He says, we left in Landris, Rivendell. We had seven companions, and he starts to name them. He mentions Boromir, and all the men go, Boromir? Boromir, son of the Lord Denthor? 
Duh. What other Boromir is there? Okay. And Frodo says, do you know the little riddle? And Faramir says, yeah. And then Frodo says, Aragorn, whom I named, is the bearer of the sword that was broken. And we're the halflings that the poem spoke of. Okay, now, from what you know of Faramir afterwards, what does Faramir understand when he hears Aragorn is the bearer of the sword that was broken? The heir is returning. All right? So they keep talking and walk while they go, and then they get attacked. And on bottom of 660 and top of 661, Sam joins the guards as the battle begins to rage. And we're told, suddenly straight over the rim of their sheltering bank, a man fell, crashing through the slender trees, nearly on top of them. He came to rest in the fern a few feet away, face downward, green arrow feathers sticking from his neck below a golden collar. His scarlet robes were tattered. His corslet of overlapping brazen plates was rent and hewn. His black plates of hair braided with gold were drenched with blood. His brown hand still clutched the hilt of a broken sword. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. Okay? He did not like it much. Notice we get... A very detailed description of a man being killed and falling. And then we get kind of an impartial observer's reflection on that. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was and where he came from. What is Sam doing to the dead warrior? Humanizing him. Trying to understand him. Wondering what his name was, rather than, oh, he's just a nameless enemy. Just an enemy, as Frodo says about Gollum. And deserves death. Wondered what the man's name was and where he came from. And if he was really evil of heart, or what lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home. And if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace. All in a flash of thought which was quickly driven from his mind. What is Sam really wondering? Why? Why do men go to war? Or you could say, why do we go to war? And again, Tolkien is not a pacifist. Tolkien does think that there are times when it is appropriate to use force. In fact, in one of his letters, he does say about Tom Bombadil that Tom Bombadil is pacifist. Tom Bombadil will not raise a weapon against somebody else. Okay? So they keep going on. And we get to chapter The Window on the West. Uh, they start to talk some more about Boromir and such. Sam doesn't really care for what's going on on page 665. And he stands up and plants his hands, you know, on his hips in front of Faramir. Who, Faramir is probably about 6'2", 6'3", and Sam's like 3 feet. Okay? And he's like, you know, Mr. Frodo, he doesn't have the right to challenge you, blah, 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 blah. And so Faramir talks about the dream first coming to him. And then he talks about sitting one night by the waters of Anduin and a boat coming down and seeing Boromir dead. Page 668. After he tells them that, Frodo says, If Boromir was then in peril and was slain, I must fear that all my companions perish too. 
Go back, Faramir, valiant captain of Gondor. Defend your city while you may, and let me go where my doom takes me. It's at this point. Hold on. It's at this point that Frodo really starts to despair. Because he now thinks, not only did we lose Gandalf, but if Boromir's dead, how can Aragorn have survived? Or Legolas, or Gimli, or Merry and Pippin. If Boromir's dead, then they must all be dead. And it's just Sam and I. And what can we do? Karen? But he says, when my doom takes me, he still intends to go on. Sure. He may see it as a hopeless struggle. He may see it as a hopeless struggle, but Frodo is quintessentially English. What does that mean? Never give up. Never give up. Okay? You, you march on, you keep going, or let me rephrase it. You could say he's quintessentially Germanic. There is a, a strain in Germanic ideology, and you, you really see this best expressed in Old English literature, okay? where no matter the odds, if you're terrifically outnumbered, you keep fighting. There's an Old English poem called The Battle of Malden. which is about a battle that was fought in 991 by a group of, of English against the Vikings. The English were woefully outnumbered. Okay, They fought the Vikings, but they all died in this battle. There's a poem written probably around 993, we think, where somebody kind of um, imagines what the English said as the battle was raging on. And towards the end of it, after the leader of the English is killed and hacked down, the remaining English kind of form a circle around his body. And this one grizzled old war veteran essentially says, our hearts must be stronger, our courage the firmer, as our numbers wane. As we get fewer and fewer, boys, we got to man up. <laughs> Why? Because he's going to die with his Lord. It's not, oh, the Lord's dead. Okay, we give. You can have what you want. We'll give you the tribute. No. It's, they killed our Lord, the dirty, rotten SOBs. We're going to kill every last one of them that we can or die trying. Okay? Take as many down with you. Take as many down with you. Exactly. I mean, Harry says it later on. When he and, he and Dumbledore are having a talk, he's like, yeah, I'm going to take every last Death Eater I can with me as I go. And Dumbledore's, well, oh, very good, Harry. <laughs> Just like your father. Even though in the back of his mind, he's going, no, you won't, Harry. Because you're not a killer. Okay? So they keep talking. Um, page 669. As... Faramir, Frodo, and Sam kind of break off from the rest of the group. Faramir says, yeah, you know, I, I shouldn't have pushed you too hard back there. Because back there, there were other members of the Rangers of, Thil of Athelion around them. And he says, you spoke with skill in a hard place and wisely. He says, I, I understand about Boromir. Isildur's bane, eh, he would have wanted it. All right? Clearly, Isildur's bane is a mighty heirloom of some sort. Do I not hit near the mark? And Frodo's like, eh, getting close. But let's not talk about it right now. Okay? They keep talking. Faramir mentions Gandalf. And Frodo talks about Gandalf's death. Okay? And they keep talking. In page 671, Faramir says, What in truth this thing is, I cannot yet guess. That is Isildur's bane. But some heirloom of power and peril it must be. A fell weapon, perchance, devised by the Dark Lord. If it were a thing that would give advantage in battle, 
Boromir would want it. But fear no more. I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway. In other words, if I was walking down the road and there was a sign that said, Isildur's Bane, pointing to the ground, he says, I would not stoop to pick it up. Not where Minas Tirith falling in ruin, and I alone could save her. So, so, thus, using the weapon of the Dark Lord for her good in my glory. I do not wish for such triumphs. Faramir is not a utilitarian. And by that I mean, Faramir will not use any means possible. To achieve his goals. For Faramir, the means must be commensurate with the goals. That is, if the goal is good, the means used to achieve the goal must also be good. There can't be any cheating involved, for example. There can't be any evil involved. So to achieve the preservation of Minas Tirith, it cannot be achieved using a tool of Sauron's. Why? Because that will taint Minas Tirith. It's like, you know, read a political thriller, a political novel, and what happens to every time when somebody uses illicit means to gain power? The illicit means they use always comes back to bite them. Whether it's, you know, they blackmailed somebody, they bought an office, whatever. The person always involved helping in the blackmail or the buying of the office has what over the person now in power? Leverage. Leverage. Okay. So they continue talking. They have dinner. They have wine. They have a little almost like prayer on page 676. They stop, firm in all his men, stand and they turn and they face west in a moment of silence. Now keep in mind, when they face west, they're looking out through the window on the west. They're looking out through the waterfall at the falling sun. And he says, so we always do. We look towards Numenor that was and beyond to elven home that is, that is Valinor, Notice Numenor that was, because it no longer exists, Valinor is, and to that which is beyond Elven home and will ever be. Now there's no other way to understand this other than the divine, whatever that is. Okay? Have you no such custom? Frodo, no. <laughs> we just eat. <laughs> All right? This is the closest you get to a quote-unquote religious service or event in the entire Lord of the Rings. All right? So they start to eat and drink and drink and maybe drink a little more because page 680 Sam's talking, and he's talking about Stroider, Aragorn, that is, or old Mr. Bilbo and such. And then they mention, you know, um, Galadriel. And Faramir says, well, she must be lovely indeed, perilously fair. Sam, oh, I don't know about perilous. Strikes me that folk takes their peril with them in Delorean, finds it there because they brought it. But perhaps you could call her perilous. Because she's so strong in herself, you, you could dash yourself to pieces on her like ship on a rock. Or drown yourself like Aubrey in a river, but neither rock nor river. Now Bora, you know, maybe. Yes, now Boromir, you would say, he took his peril with him. Yes, sir, begging your pardon. And he goes on and on and on, and he says, It's my opinion that in Lorien he first saw clearly what I guess sooner, what he wanted. From the moment he first saw it, he wanted the enemy's reign. Sam! You know, it's on the Ingray. <laughs> OK? 
right? Faramir, the ring, the ring of power, and midgets have it for me. Sam and Frodo stand up, backs to the wall, pull out their swords. Faramir, alas for Boromir, it was too sore a trial. You are less judges of men than I of halflings. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We both seldom and then perform or die in the attempt. That is, if we make a boast, we fulfill it or we die trying. That's another line right out of the Wanderer. <laughs> Building his poem. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it, I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire this thing, and even though I knew not clearly what this thing was when I spoke, I should take these words as a vow. In other words, even if now I did want the ring, I told you before, I wouldn't take it. And I will keep to my word. How different is that from what Peter Jackson does in the film? It makes Boromir seem more human. Okay, you could say he makes Faramir seem more human, more temptable. What else does he do? Faramir actually does start taking them back to the city. He takes, he doesn't start taking, he takes Frodo and Sam all the way back to Asgiliath because he wants to take them to Denethor. In other words, he completely takes the character of Faramir and puts a 12-gauge shotgun shell through its head. He kills it. Why? He doesn't either... He doesn't understand Faramir, or there's not enough suspense for the film to be suspenseful. Not enough suspense? Or does he fear that Faramir's too noble, too ethereal, too unhuman? Because you have to know the ring, despite take that Faramir took the oath, the ring's still going to try to pull at him. Sure, him sure. And you know, he has to be tempted, even though he swore an oath and would fulfill that oath to his death. But I think what Tolkien is suggesting is, you know what? Even if you're tempted, what can you do? Resist it. You can resist. That is, everybody doesn't have to go, oh, temptation, sure, thank you. I'll take whatever it is, you know. Just roll over and give in, all right? So he goes on and he says some things. He says, you know, chill out, Sam. Don't worry. I don't want it. So we get the chapter of the Forbidden Pool where they capture Gollum. Gollum tells him what his plan is, where he's going to take them. Faramir looks in Gollum's eyes. Notice who else have we seen look into somebody's eyes? Gandalf looks into Pippin's once. When else? When they arrive in Lothlorien, and they climb up into Gladriel's treehouse. She holds each of them with her eyes, kind of reading into them. So we see Galadriel do that, we see Gandalf do that, and we see Faramir do that. Well, Frodo has already said, you know, you remind me of Gandalf. Okay? That is, there is a nobility of character there. So... Faramir says, you're going to go to Kirith. Uncle, are you crazy? Frodo's like, give me another option. I need to get to Mordor. I need to find Mount Doom and chuck the ring. Can't go through the Black Gate. It's locked. Don't want to knock on the door. Give me another way. Where then shall I go? Okay. He's, I, I don't know. So, they go. Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. And they make their way to the crossroads. Okay. Which is a road leading south, and a road leading north, and a road leading east, and a road leading west. They're taking the eastern road. And page 702, the very last, chap uh, very last page of that chapter, before the stairs of Kirith Ungol. They're standing at the road. And we're told, standing there for a moment, filled with dread, 
Frodo became aware that a light was shining. He saw it glowing on Sam's face beside him. Turning towards it, he saw, beyond an arch of boughs, the road to Osgiliath running almost as straight as a stretched ribbon down, down, into the west. And notice the west is capitalized. It's like Frodo turns and looks, and he sees the boughs, the, the arched bough of the trees. And the road leads down. Keep in mind, he saw the sun shining on Sam's face. So the sunlight is coming down this road, and it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes to the west. It's like saying, this is the road to heaven. All right? And there, far away, the sun was sinking, finding at last the hem of the great slow polling, rolling pall of cloud, etc. And the brief glow fell upon a huge sitting figure. The years had gnawed it. Violent hands had maimed it. Frodo sees this sitting statue. And it's got graffiti all over it. And upon its knees and mighty chair, and all about the pedestal were idle scrawls mixed with foul symbols that the maggot folk of Mordor used. And suddenly, as the sun sets and sets and sets, its beams catch the old king's head. Now, the king's head is no longer on the king's body. So you've got a headless body sitting on a throne, statue, and then the head is lying over in the weeds. And Frodo says to Sam, look, Sam. Look, the king has got a crown again. The eyes were hollow, the carven beard was broken, but about the high stern forehead there was a coronal of silver and gold. There are flowers wrapped around the king's head. And now the sun is shining directly on it. This is a little visual catastrophe. Because what does this little image do to Frodo? It gives him hope. It gives him hope. Okay? A trailing plant with flowers like small white stars had bound itself across the boughs as brows as if in reverence for the fallen king. And Frodo says, they cannot conquer forever. And the sun dips and it's dark. Okay? They cannot conquer forever. In the SM fairy stories, Tolkien tells us about the Eucatastrophe <coughs> that what it shows is not that this catastrophe does not exist. Okay? It doesn't say, oh, just believe the sun will come up tomorrow. Everything will be fine. No. He says what it does show, and he says in parentheses, in the face of much evidence to the contrary, is that this and evil will not have the final say, will not ultimately prevail. What the U catastrophe shows, he says, it's like a glimmer of heaven. It's like the sky is opened up and you see what is really real. Okay? For Frodo, this little shining of light gives him an element of hope. As we saw earlier, when Gandalf takes Theoden outside his hall, and he stands on the porch, and the sun breaks through the clouds, we see that stab of shining light. And he says, all is not so dark here. In other words, it's not completely filthy and rotten, the world is. Okay? So, they start to make their way up the stairs of Kirith Ungol. And they go, and they go, and they go, and they go, and they go. And on page 711, they sit down to rest. Sam's thirsty, Frodo's thirsty. Okay. And they start to talk. And Frodo says, just after the middle of the page, and Sam says, it's a queer kind of smell, stuffy, I don't like it. Frodo says, I don't like anything here at all. Step or stone, breath or bone, earth, air, and water all seem accursed. 
but so our path is laid. Okay? Notice the difference between that statement and what he said at the beginning of the Dead Marshes. How do we shape our path, Gollum? Implying we've got all kinds of freedom of choice. We have all kinds of freedom here. Now, Frodo is saying, there's no freedom anymore. Now it's just doom. Now we are fated. This is how our path is laid before us. Well, Sam's going to take that statement, and he's going to start to take it apart a little bit, and he's going to start to develop it. For uh, Sam. Yes, that's so. And we should be here all if we'd know more about it before we started. That is, and we wouldn't be on this path if way back last year, Gandalf had told us everything. I mean, when he said, and Sam, you're going to go with Frodo, me, go and see elves and all, as Sam says. Oh, go and see elves and all, and almost get killed, and go off into dirt, gate, musty towers. Mm, don't think so. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things and the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventures, as I used to call them. Notice, used to to call them. Why doesn't he call them adventures anymore? Okay, why else? Did you say them? What? Because he's on one, and what is it? It's not an adventure. It's life. It's real life for Sam. I used to think that there were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for. Why? Because they wanted them. Because they wanted adventures. Even in The Hobbit, Bilbo didn't want an adventure. The adventure landed in his lap. Because they were exciting and life was a bit dull. A kind of a sport, as you might say. Remember what Frodo told Gandalf? You know, I used to wish that we would have an earthquake or an invasion of dragons to shake people out of their complacency, as it were. Sam, but that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them usually. Their paths were laid that way, as you put it. Now, I think when we're thinking about these tales that Sam was talking about, we have to think about what kind of tales did Tolkien like. Okay? He was a scholar of Old and Middle English. He loved Beowulf. He loved Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. How do I know? Because he did an edition of it. He wrote articles about it. Well, in both Beowulf, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, all the other stuff of Old English, as well as some of the other Middle English, along with Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, what do you see? You see people doing great things. Because they want to? No. Because that's how their paths are laid. In other words, those are the intersections that happen in their lives. Okay, Kind of like Todd Beamer and the guys on Flight 93. They didn't choose to have that plane hijacked that morning, but the plane was hijacked. And then what did they have? The doom of choice. They decided what to do. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back. Only they didn't. When could Frodo and Sam have turned back? Anytime they wanted to. Farmer Maggots? Crick Hollow? Rivendell? Frodo didn't have to say, okay, I'll take the ring. I don't know where I'm going, but, you know. Yes, they could have turned back. Any one of those times. Galadriel's? Only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know, because they'd have been forgotten. What if Beowulf, how many of you know the story of Beowulf? Even if you've only had it through crappy AP classes in high school where you didn't read the whole story and you read a really bad translation, okay? 
What would we know about Beowulf if Beowulf never went to fight Grendel? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's because he chooses to go fight Grendel that there is a poem about him. Because if he didn't choose, exactly, there'd be Grendel and Hrothgar. <laughs> and it'd be totally different. What about if King Arthur never pulled the blinking sword out of the stone? He'd be nobody. The only reason we have tales to read is because the people in the tales do something and not something else. Okay? They go on, as Sam says, rather than going back. We hear about those as just went on. And not all to a good end, mind you. Think of King Arthur. What is his end? How does he die? Get betrayed. By? Okay, you could say by Lancelot. By Mordred, his son. Slash... Yeah, <laughs> I always forget that. It's, you know, it's like Oedipus. It's just too weird to think about. It, okay, His son slash nephew is responsible for his death. And you could throw in all kinds of other stuff with Sir Gowan and Lancelot, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Yeah, I mean, it's just family. <laughs> At least not to what folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. We read, you know, King Arthur today. Oh, man, what a great story. Nobility, chivalry, all that kind of nonsense. But we're outside the story, right? It's easy on us. Can I help you? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Just wondering because it's kind of like, um, not, we're not inside the story. What about for those inside the story? What does Sir Gowan think by the end? Damn. <laughs> Lancelot, Guinevere, Tristan and he's old. Not yeah. Okay. Let, let's take a, a quote unquote real story. The fireman running up the two towers. Great ending? Yeah. What about their families? What about the children who went to the schools in New York City and never had mom and dad come home? For those inside the story, it can be hell. For those outside the story, reading in, however, they can see things that those inside the story don't see. They can see how good can come out of such horrible things. And so what does Sam say then, call us a good end? You know, coming home, finding things all right, though not quite the same like old Mr. Bilbo. Well, what has Sam just told us? Scouring of the Shire? And, well, I'm home. Notice, for... Sam, the Lord of the Rings, does end as a good story, even for the one inside it. He has what he always wanted out of life. He's married. He has children. He has a little plot of garden. He is fat, dumb, and happy. All three, I mean, he's got everything, right? He says, but those aren't always the best Tales to hear. This is the problem with Disney. Disney takes all those wonderful old Grimm's fairy tales and does what? It Disneyfies them. It makes them all have a happy ending. It makes them all have a happy ending. You know, read um, Cinderella in Grimm's version. You know, the evil, wicked stepsisters who cut their toes off so that they'll fit into the glass slipper, okay? Or the stepmother, I think, is, who's put on the, thrown into the fire. I mean, 
The Grimm's Tales are not They're grim. Um, sanitized. Yeah, they are grim. Okay. Hansel and Gretel. What happens to the old witch? She gets burned. She gets burned in the oven. I mean, Hansel and Gretel, those are mean little brats. Okay. <laughs> What does Disney do to almost everything? It's happily ever after. It's tangled, you know. With Amy Adams sailing through New York City, you know, she'd get raped and murdered and everything else that would happen if it were the real New York. So, Sam says, those may not be the best tales to hear, though they must be, may be the best tales to get landed in. And then he asks, what kind of tale are we in? Pro, don't know. And that's the way of a real tale. Right? You don't know your own end, so you don't know if you're in a good tale or not. How many of us knows how our tale ends? Well, uh, you know, unless you've got a fairy godmother who says, on such and such a day, you're going to, you know, croak. None of us do. None of us know how from this point of life to this point of death, how the road goes. I mean, we like to think, it's going to be a nice, straight, easy path. Doesn't usually work out that way. Frodo, you may know or guess what kind of a tale it is. Happy ending, sad ending. But the people in it don't know. Baron and Luthien didn't know. And you don't want them to. Why not? What happens to people who know how their tale will end? They try to change it. Think Oedipus. The tale of Oedipus the king. He hears a prophecy. You are fated to kill your father, marry and sleep with your mother. Any one of you has that prophecy about you, or for you women, it's your father instead. What do you think you're going to do? Hell no. I'm going to stop this from happening. Well, Oedipus thinks the same. And his very attempt to stop it from happening makes it happen. For, uh, uh, Sam. Well, of course not. Baron now, he never thought he was going to get that Silmaril from the Iron Crown in Thangora Drim, and yet he did, and that was a worse place in Blacker Danger than ours. But that's a long tale, of course. Goes on past the happiness and into grief and beyond it. And the Silmaril went on and came to Arendelle. And I never thought of it before. We... You've got some of the light of it in that star glass. Got the... We're in the same tale still. It's going on. In other words, Aragorn didn't tell us the whole tale. <laughs> Why? Because Why? Aragorn's a character in the tale. Have you ever read a story where a character in the story is aware that the character is in a story? And telling the story. Mm -hmm. Read Stephen King's um, Dark Tower series. And in the later novels, like the second to the last one or so, you have Stephen King in the novel writing The Dark Tower. <laughs> you know, it blows your mind, right? Don't the great tales never end? Frodo, no, they never end as tales. But the people in them come and go. So they keep talking. And then Sam says, top of 713, well, even Gollum might be good in the tale. <laughs> Better than to have in real life. Where is he? Do you think Gollum thinks he's the hero or the villain? The hero. Is Gollum the hero or the villain? It's not really either. Okay. Both. It's ambiguous. How does the ring get destroyed? Gollum destroys it. Is Gollum the hero or the villain? Yes. And I don't mean that ambiguously. The hero sometimes is the villain, and the villain sometimes is the hero. Does Gollum bite the ring off Frodo's finger and say, I have the ring, the ring is not mine, the ring must be destroyed. Therefore, for the good of all Middle-earth, I will sacrifice myself in the ring and die. No. 
What does he do? It's mine, my precious, my precious, my precious. Ah! You know. But when Gollum bites the ring off Frodo's finger, what is he also aware of? What did Frodo say to him the very last time? Do not ever touch me again. The next time you touch me, you yourself will be cast into the fires of doom. So let me rephrase that. It may have been Frodo saying that. It might also have been the ring saying that. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get to that point. So, Frodo says, I think Gollum is really in part, top of 714, trying to save the precious from the enemy. So after this long passage, Frodo and Sam fall asleep. And then we get what I think is the most moving part of the entire tale. They're sitting there asleep. Frodo's got his head in, in Sam's lap. Sam has one hand on Frodo's brow and another hand on Frodo's chest. And they're just sacked out. And Gollum comes back down. And we're told, 714, Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes, and they went dim and gray, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him, and he turned away, peering back up towards the pass, shaking his head as if engaged in some interior debate. And then he came back, and slowly putting out a trembling hand, very cautiously he touched Frodo's knee. Almost the touch was a caress. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him, they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin, and the fields and streams of youth, an old, starved, pitiable thing. What is Gollum at this moment? Or, true self. okay, true self. What is Tolkien showing us about Gollum? That he is pitiable. Pitiable, what else? Why does he put his hand on Frodo's knee? Why not his foot? Why not his leg? Why not his it's arm? Okay, whenever in literature someone reaches out and touches another person's knee or clasps their hands around their knee or puts their head on their knee, they're seeking one thing, mercy, to actually two things, and blessing. Gollum is connecting for the first time with other hobbits. Notice, the gleam goes out of his eyes. He's in interior debate. This is Gollum's possibility right here for cure. For being cured. And what happens? Slams the door on his what are you up to? Where have you been sneaking to? Sam, not Frodo. Sam, sorry. Okay. And what happens? As soon as Sam says, sneaking to, sneaking back, the old villain, Gollum withdrew himself. That is the old, starved, pitiable, hungry, lean hobbit that was coming out. He pulled back, and a green glint flickered under his heavy lids. Almost spider-like you look now. That's it. That was his shot. That was his opportunity. And Sam killed it. Because how did Sam respond? Say it again. And? Out of what? Judgment, hatred, fear. Okay. We'll pick up uh, the Shelob's Lair on whatever day it is, Thursday.